Oh my gosh. Hello and welcome back to Bites of History with Irene Walton. I'm your host, Irene Walton. And you saw the title, you saw the thumbnail. Today's going to be super weird. Have you ever wondered how it made it to your table? Have you ever wondered how it made it to your shelf? If you love food, then this is the show for you. Bites of History with Irene. Today is actually going to be a two-parter, so this is going to be the first part of John Harvey Kellogg's story, who he was, how Kellogg's cereal came to be. It's such a crazy story, my friends, Um, and I think you're going to love it. So let's get started. I want to thank my patrons so, 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 I want to thank my patrons so much for all of the support. It is a real joy to see people joining and popping in and letting me know what they want to hear from the podcast and videos and things like that. And it's just very lovely. So thank you to all my patrons. If you guys would like to be a patron, you can join my Patreon at patreon.com slash Irene Walton. It starts at just $2 a month. So go check that out. I also want to thank all of the wonderful sources that I used today. We used mentalfloss.com, wikipedia.org, pbs.org, the Stuff You Should Know podcast. You guys know I love them. Um, And battlecreekvisitors.org. So our story begins in Tyrone, Michigan in 1852 on February 26th when John Harvey Kellogg is born. He's born to his father, John Kellogg, and he is his father's second wife's child. So John and his mom are married, but this is John's second wife. Anyway, prior to this marriage, John had six children with his first wife, and he has 11 children with his second wife, John included. So John is one of 17. Now, with so many siblings, I'm sure a lot of them did a lot of other stuff, but the two that we're going to be focusing on today, mostly John Harvey Kellogg and his younger brother, eight years younger, Will Kellogg. But we'll get to Will in a little bit. Now, John's father came from Massachusetts, but found the Seventh Day Adventist Church when he lived there. He became a big follower, big believer in the Seventh Day Adventist teachings and church, etc. And when he moved to Michigan from Massachusetts, he like really convinced the Seventh Day Adventist like founders or leaders or whoever, he convinced the Seventh-day Adventist like big group to come to Michigan as well. So John Harvey Kellogg, the son, grew up a Seventh-day Adventist. And this was all happening in Battle Creek, Michigan. If you guys don't know what a Seventh-day Adventist is, don't worry, I did not either. Literally the only, this is so silly, the only knowledge I had about Seventh-day Adventist uh, Christians were, was from Gilmore Girls. <laughs> because Lane Kim and her mom, Mrs. Kim, are Seventh-day Adventists. Which actually, actually, when I was doing all this research, the, it made a lot more sense. I thought that, like, her mom was just, like, a health nut. But it turns out that that's a huge, huge part of the Seventh-day Adventist teachings and belief system and faith is, like, very, very healthy foods. But we're going to get into that more in a little bit. So the whole Kellogg family was majorly Seventh-day Adventist. All of the kids grew up very strongly influenced and, you know, closely surrounded by Seventh-day Adventist church and teachings. They felt that like a clean and healthy mind equaled a clean and healthy soul. Like when you did something good, or I'm sorry, body, a clean and healthy body equaled a clean and healthy soul. And when you did something good for your body, you were doing something good for your soul which would then get you closer to getting a spot in heaven. My under And please, if anybody is a Seventh-day Adventist or does know a lot about faith and I'm getting any of this wrong, I do apologize. This is just like my, my you know, I'm not researching these for weeks at a time. So it is like relatively preliminary research, but this is my understanding of it. So if I do get anything incorrect, I am, I am sorry. I'm not saying it in a negative way or like in a judgy way. I just mess the research up. It's not intentional if it is messed up. My understanding is that Seventh-day Adventists also believed that there were like a finite number of spots in heaven sticking like to their faith and to the codes that they believed in was incredibly important to get one of those spots in heaven. Now, with 17 children, John Kellogg Sr., it's not actually senior. I think with senior, you have to have the same middle name, but this was, they're both named John Kellogg. So 
We're just going to call the dad senior. John Kellogg Sr., because he believed so strongly in Seventh-day Adventist um, teachings and the faith, they also believed that the end of the world was coming very quickly. So there really was not much of a focus on the Kellogg parents to the children for education because they thought that the world was going to end. So they were like, school's not that important. So they didn't really send the kids to school much. Like John Kellogg, John Harvey, the junior, the one um, who we're talking about today, he only went to school from ages like nine to 11. So it was not anything crazy. He was a very, very bright kid, though. Like he was very smart, picked things up very quickly, loved to read, um, but did not stay in school very long because they thought the end of the world was coming. With the Seventh-day Adventist teachings, we'll see that these are such an integral part of John Harvey Kellogg's life, and they spread in ways that are detrimental and also really amazing. Um, Because at this time, in the mid to late 1800s, America is eating like garbage, like disgusting, like things we would never, ever, ever eat today. Like like 15 course meals of just like meat and fat. Really, this is not me trying to pass judgment on anybody who eats just meat and fat work. Live your best. It was it's not nobody could argue that that's not the most well-rounded diet in the world. So Seventh Day Adventists were really trying to combat this and being like, we have to keep our bodies clean and you know, good so that our souls are clean and good, etc. So in John's heart, he grew up knowing that like, Food is really important. Diet and exercise are really important. That's how you're going to get into heaven. That's how you're like a good person. That's how you're a clean, like pure person. And he's looking around him growing up and he's seeing all of these incredibly unhealthy people because of what they're eating and what they're doing or not doing with and for their body. And there's this thing um, going around at the time called dyspepsia, which is kind of the feeling of like, after all these gigantic, heavy, 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 unhealthy meals that everyone's eating, they're feeling very lethargic and bloated and constipated, but also like getting diarrhea at the same time. So it's just like a very unhealthy, sickly way to exist constantly. And John Kellogg was like, this ca- this can't be the best that there is. Like, I have to be able to figure something out with this and help people. And he wanted to be a teacher. That's like part of where his like voracious reading came in. He read so much. He wanted to be a teacher. And he did actually for a little bit when he was 16. He did like teach some classes and stuff, which is really cool. Um, but the Seventh-day Adventist leaders saw how bright he was, saw how quickly he picked things up. And they were starting like a medical group, medical, like we would probably think of it today as like a medical spa. They were starting like a holistic medical spa back then, the Seventh-day Adventists were, in Battle Creek, called the Western Health Reform Institute in Battle Creek. And with this, they were like, oh, you know, if we got John to go to medical school and actually be a doctor, this like medical spa might have a little more like clout behind it. Like it might be a little more easy to market if we have a real doctor there. So the Seventh-day Adventists actually helped support John Kellogg and put him through medical school. So he ends up going to the University of Michigan Medical School and then moves on to the Bellevue Medical College in New York. And by 1876, John Kellogg is a doctor and he has his Seventh-day Adventist like background in health and wellness, again, in quotes, because some of it was super legit, some of it maybe not as much. And that now he also has a full on scientific medical degree. And again, we are in the 1800s. So it's not like medicine the way we know it today. It's not super sanitary. It's not, you know, super well understood yet. But for the time, this was cutting edge information, cutting edge knowledge. Like he was actually one of the first doctors to kind of pursue like germ theory, like a long time ago, back in the 1800s, they like weren't washing their hands before surgery because they didn't, they simply didn't know. They didn't have the technology to know what germs were. So it's not their fault. That's just like what they knew thus far. So it's, it's as if John Kellogg is coming out of a medical school today. From what we know today, we're at the cutting edge, but in 20 years, they're probably going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe they treated this thing with this thing. You know what I mean? So anyway, so John is this like 
new doctor. He comes back to Battle Creek, Michigan, and he takes over the Seventh Day Western Health Reform Institute, and he renames it to the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Now, that might sound like a familiar term. It sort of became like a negative, bad place for people who had like mental health issues. A sanitarium is where um, patients with severe cases of tuberculosis would go. So it was it was known as a medical facility. Dr. Kellogg took this word and changed a vowel in it so that people would still know it's like a medical institute, but they're hearing the word sanitary and thinking it's like super clean, super, you know, whatever. So it's like, this is the new place. They also called it the San, which I love because they shortened it and I shortened everything. Um, So they called it the San for short. But now John Harvey Kellogg is in charge of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, where health and wellness are of the utmost importance. It is the it is the only priority. And he now has this background and this credibility as a real legitimate doctor. Now, John was a really well-respected doctor at the time. Although a bit of a character, um, John was known to walk around in a full, like, white three-piece suit, everything white, white shoes. He also had a big white cockatoo that he kept on his shoulder, which I think is a hilarious touch. He also had a giant white mustache. Like, he was a very interesting man, to say the least. Not going to say a good man, because some of the stuff we're going to find out. Not great, but very interesting. PBS describes him as a medical celebrity, best-selling author, magazine editor, skilled surgeon, public health expert, popular speaker, and Seventh-day Adventist Christian missionary. Dr. John Kellogg had two main concerns when it came to medicine and the health of your body. Poop and (laughs) masturbation. John thought that poop was like the thing that was making everybody so sick and so ill was like this kind of leftover poop that was still in your body. (laughs) I hate talking about poop, so I don't know why I chose this episode. But he thought that was like a huge, huge factor in what was making people so sick. Because, and the thing is, he's not fully wrong. Like, poop is a very toxic material. Like, feces is meant to be out of your body. That's why it works this way. And his theory that like when you did go to the bathroom and you did have a bowel movement, there was still some left in you. And that is like what needs to be flushed out and what needs to be taken away. He thought people needed to poop four times a day. He should meet some of my ex-boyfriends because I think they'd be doing great. Um, (laughs) He had a lot of ways to get rid of this excess poop in your body. He actually invented this like light box machine that he thought the very new light bulbs, they were like this light bulbs had come out like eight seconds before he created this. Yeah. It was like a cat, like a closet that you'd walk into with light bulbs. He thought that like boiled the poop out of your body and like kept you pure that way. And, and this is like cutting edge technology. And that's just one of the things that he made. He also had these like kneading machines, like kneading like bread with a K. And that was like a massage, big quotes there, that had like mallets that tried to like beat the extra poop out of your body. I know this is like so crazy, but he was certain that this was like the thing that was making people sick. They also had colonics, which if you don't know, are like a, um, like an interior, like an interior bowel cleanse. So it's like, they like, shoot water up your butt and it tries to like clear out all the poop from your butt, which is like, seems like there's a lot of controversy in the medical community of if they're like safe or not. Seems like they sort of cause some issues sometimes. Not sure about that, but he was doing that back then. But to, to Dr. Kellogg's credit, one of the things that was very interesting about him, especially during this time in American medicine, was that he was one of the first and only doctors that believed in preventative medicine versus like trying to fix a problem after it's happened, like diagnostic medicine. He was like, listen, if we keep our bodies healthy, we will probably just be healthy. And that was like groundbreaking information. He also was an inventor of a lot of meat alternatives. And you guys, Up until 10 years ago, probably less, people were still like 
making fun of tofu and like whatever. Now you can go to a store. They have a whole section for meat alternatives. This is 150 years ago. Dr. Kellogg is making meat alternatives out of nuts and out of things because he part of the Seventh Day Adventist teachings are that you're supposed to be vegetarian, like you're not supposed to consume animal products or like animal flesh. And so he was creating these. He also was one of the first people to really introduce in the medical field, because again, this is coming from his Seventh Day Adventist background, like regular exercise, like riding a bike outside and that being really good for you. He believed in the power of whole foods. He did not believe in salt and sugar and additives. And I believe me, we all know I love salt and sugar, so I'm not saying that's the best way to live. I'm just saying, like, he was one of these first doctors to recognize, like, maybe a lot of that isn't great. And also, he's one of the first doctors ever to be like, hey, don't smoke cigarettes. They're killing you. So he was, he really was, like, a medical mind that was helping people get healthier in some ways. In other ways... He was a ghoul. He thought that masturbation was like the ultimate sin. Almost as bad as eating sugar. Like he thought that masturbation was like the worst thing somebody could do ever. It was so horrible. It sent you straight to hell. Like, oh, my God. And he had a lot of very treacherous things that he did to curb masturbating in his patients, men and women. I don't feel comfortable saying them on a video. So if you would like further details on exactly what that was, feel free to go look it up, not while you're eating. Uh, But I will tell you that there were sutures involved, which are like stitches with a needle, and there's acid involved. There are ropes involved. There's a lot involved. This was like, this was his thing. This was like, if he could have taken one thing out from the world, I think he would have taken masturbation out because the things he did to stop it in patients was (sighs) terrible. So now we know who John Kellogg is. He is a doctor who is a strong proponent of a healthy, quote unquote, again, well-rounded diet and exercise and also thought that masturbation was going to be the thing that sent you straight to hell in the devil's arms. So the Battle Creek Sanitarium is this mecca of health. And the way that he's promoted it is exactly that. It is like the place to go if you're not feeling well and you need to feel well. And he's going to take care of everything. He's going to take care of the food and the medical, you know, um, procedures and the this and the this. And so the Battle Creek Sanitarium very quickly gets super popular because it's it's not only a mecca of of food and health and medicine. It's also like a very luxurious place to go. Again, we would be thinking of this like a very fancy, like medical spa in Malibu. It's got this beautiful China. It has a conservatory indoors with like tropical plants that was like sort of acted like a sauna because it was always so warm and humid there. You also... You know, you're going to this this place, the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and you've heard so much about, imagine we're like in, you know, the 1890s, and you've heard so much about this Dr. John Kellogg, you're basically guaranteed that you're going to see him too. Like, he is your doctor. And that's crazy. That's like if, that's like if if you go to the movies and you're certain that Jennifer Aniston is going to be there like answering your question about the movie. Like that's, that's pretty crazy. And so the appeal of the Battle Creek Sanitarium very, very quickly spreads and very quickly as well. It gets some pretty high level clientele. Some of the guests of the Battle Creek Sanitarium include Mary Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's wife, Amelia Earhart, President William Howard Taft, Sojourner Truth, Henry Ford, uh, um, C.W. Post. Does that ring a bell? It will in a minute. Anyway, we're getting celebrities in there. We're getting people in there with a ton of money. Like, 
Kellogg is also connected to the Titanic. Some of these crazy exercise machines that John Kellogg has invented get shipped and are on the Titanic in the like gymnasium first level, like first class area. So he is very much associated with like the upper class. The Battle Creek Sanitarium is the place to get fixed up and not jerk off. <laughs> Now, part of the Battle Creek Sanitarium was that you had everything provided, and that's food included. And like we've talked about, Dr. Kellogg had a lot of thoughts on food. He thought that you needed to chew your food 40 times before you swallowed it. He, he gave very almond mom. Like, it was very much like, do you want a sandwich or would you like a handful of walnuts? And that was kind of his energy. He also was a huge proponent in like, digestion and gut health. And he thought that the easier things were to digest, the better they were for you, the more easily your poop would move through you, the less sick you would get. So they cooked things down like crazy. Like, you know, when you when you let your chicken soup sit too long and your celery is like mushy and you're like, Ugh, this is gross. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. But like, that's the like mush factor we're talking. He also would bake things down a lot. So like these crackers that he would make for breakfast, he would double bake them. So he would bake them once and then bake them again so that they were even easier to digest. And all of these like nutrients have been cooked down for you. So your body doesn't have to do it. But they were so hard and so gross that people were actually breaking their teeth on them and they didn't want to get sued. So they were like, we got to figure something else out. So him and his brother, Will, I realized we didn't really talk about Will when I said we would. Basically, John was really abusive and terrible to his brother, Will. Just the worst. Um, he would, like, go on bike rides and have Will jog beside him and, like, take notes because that's when John Kellogg would, like, dictate things to him. He would never give his brother credit. He never, like, was kind to his brother. So Will was like a really pissed off guy, but he was a better businessman than John was. So they still stuck together in this Battle Creek sanitarium business that they had going. So him and his brother Will go to another sanitarium because they're like, oh, this other guy who's running a sanitarium, James Caleb Jackson, I wonder what he's doing for food for breakfast in the morning for his sick patients. So they go and they see what uh, Mr. Jackson's doing. Turns out he's making this thing called granula, which is like this really, really hard wheat nugget that has to be like soaked in milk or water overnight before it's even edible. But it's like, you know, one of these just like very like, quote unquote, again, healthy things. So John and Will see that and they're like, oh, my God, that is a great idea. Let's just take that. Exactly. And we'll call it granula and we'll steal the recipe and we'll serve it at our place and it'll be ours. <laughs> so then James Caleb Jackson like gets gets wind of this and is like, hey, stop that. And the brothers, the brothers Kellogg are like, yeah, yeah, OK, OK, for sure, for sure, for sure. So then they like change the name to granola. Again, here goes John changing one letter of something change the name to granola and like switch the recipe up a little bit. And then basically they get grape nuts. And if you're thinking, if you're like me and you're like, wait, aren't grape nuts a post cereal? They most certainly are. CW Post, who was staying at the Battle Creek Sanitarium run by John Kellogg, steals the grape nuts recipe and starts his own cereal business. Everyone's stealing these disgusting grape nuts and I don't know why. <laughs> Anyway, that's how we get grape nuts and that's how we get post cereal. We can do another episode on post cereal if you'd like. But anyway, everyone's stealing this disgusting thing, but whatever. Because remember, there's no sugar. There's no salt in any of this because it's John Kellogg and he thinks that that's like the devil's powder. So he doesn't use it. And it's super gross. But he also like is like, OK, so now we have these like gross little grape nuts what else can we do? What else can we make? Because this idea of like a breakfast cereal is kind of the vibe. So him and his brother and potentially John Kellogg's wife, it's not entirely sure if that's the case. So I'm just going to say 
him and his brother because it's not like he would have given his wife credit anyway. Let's say his wife too. Why not? Him and his brother and his wife start experimenting with other grain. So they're trying, you know, barley, they're trying rye, and then they try corn. And part of these experiments were like rolling things super flat. So when they were trying these different grains, they would, you know, mash them together, roll them really flat, etc. So one day they're like, you know, in the kitchen experimenting with corn, rolling out the dough, trying stuff out. But then John has to go go do a surgery or gets called out for some reason. So Will is notoriously frugal. Again, he's sort of more of the business mind of things. So he's always thinking about the money side. And he's like, damn, well, we have this like whole slab of dough that we can't work on right now because John just went up to surgery. We'll just put it off to the side, whatever. So when Will sets this corn dough off to the side, it actually starts to do this thing um, called tempering, which is like a light molding of things. Not to the point where like it's going to make you sick, like if you ate like a really moldy strawberry, but it's just the way in which the air reacted to the dough made it mold a little and it's called tempering. So then when they baked off this very, very thinly rolled, slightly tempered dough, it flaked up and this changed everything. And it makes it, it made it like a perfect little flake. And John was over the moon about this because he was like, wow, this is going to be a perfect, like healthy light breakfast for my sick patients. And Will was like, you know, this is kind of, this might just be good for everybody. Like, I don't think the people need to be sick. It might just be nice to have like a little light breakfast. But anyway, John being John and like the abusive big brother takes this information, goes to the patent office and gets a patent for flaked cereal all by himself. Only his name is on it. And on April 14th, 1896, we see John Kellogg's patent for flaked cereals under his name only. Now, understandably, Will is really pissed about this, but we'll pause on that for a second. They start selling this just like outside of the sanitarium as well, because prior it had just been like an inside, like an insular thing for this uh, Battle Creek. They start selling it outside and it's selling okay, but not great. And Will is like, maybe it would sell better if it didn't taste like ass. What if we added some sugar and salt? And John hated this idea. John hated sugar. He hated salt. He hated masturbation. He hated everything fun. So John is pissed. He's like, absolutely not. That's not going to happen. And this is where I leave you for today's episode. Ah! All right. This is a really fun one. This is a really interesting one. Thank you guys for being here for this. And I can't wait for part two next week or maybe this week. I don't know what the vibe is. Maybe I'll put out two. Whatever. Either way, the next Bites of History will be part two of why Kellogg is Kellogg. I love you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.